please come talk to me because all I need is communication. Don't leave me standing on my own because all I need is communication. Da 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 da. So don't leave me here alone. Bring me the bad word. Yo, 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 yo. Hey, Jonah, how are you, man? Good, man. How are you holding up? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. I appreciate you doing this. I'm super excited. I'm happy to be here. Honored, man. Um, yeah. How's your world? It's, it's doing well. It's doing well. Um, I'm Adam, and this how podcast is about you and uh, obviously the <laughs> one line drawing and your, your journey in music, if you don't mind getting into that a bit. I'd love that, man. I look forward to wherever this goes. Incredible. Uh, did I see that you played a house party in San Diego like a week or so ago? I was supposed to, uh, okay. and I would have loved to. It's a place I've played a couple of times, and I love backyard shows, and they have a particularly gorgeous one. And the hosts got COVID, and so I was not able oh, to play. Bummer. Was it in? Okay. How did, I'm, I'm curious. I'm originally from San Diego. I just moved oh, okay. to nashville a little over a year ago um but i saw that i'm like is this real like a house a house show in san diego like is it and then it said near poway which is like kind of where i grew up so i'm curious oh, cool. yeah, it, yeah. is that where it was like is it yeah is that truly where... yeah, yeah yeah oh my gosh um yeah these uh real sweet people i know have a house there and i i've been yeah i've been really enjoying house shows for I don't know, 20 plus years now. And I obviously sure. still love traditional venues and all sorts of things, but there's something about playing in a home or in a backyard. Um, I kind of wish that more really successful artists could, could experience it. And it's one of the things I'm grateful about for my career, as it were, that, you know, I can do festivals and I can do the things, but I can also a little fly low and just kind of be, in, in people's homes and yards and record stores and restaurants. And I just really love that part of music. I think that's amazing. And when I saw that, I was like, oh my gosh. And then he was by Poway. Like the fact that he's playing a house, like a house show in Poway area, like this is blowing my mind. That's so cool. Yeah. One of the strangest things about my life, I'm sure it happens all the time. For instance, someone will write to my website, write to me through my website and, mm -hmm. um, and it might be about an order they got or something. And then I will write them back personally and I'll have people literally not believe that it's me. And so it's this funny thing where I've obviously had flirtations with the mainstream over the years um, enough that people sort of see it that way, but then they make this presumption that there's gonna be eight layers of managers and everything to get to me when, again, what I love about the internet and about making music for a living is the personal part. Mm -hmm. So it's just a really, it's a really fun thing to kind of help break down those walls with people. I really enjoy it. I think that's so amazing. Yeah. I would assume, I mean, I don't know you, but I would think like, okay, yeah, this probably isn't him, but maybe if you signed your name, but it's just still one of those things. Like, I mean, the, the influence yeah. you've had on the, on the music industry and like certain artists that I grew up like loving and yeah. just seeing like the impact that you've made, it, like I could see how somebody would be like, eh, I don't know if that's really him <laughs> responding to me. Yeah, it's a it's a sort of a surreal feeling, but but I, I mean I do I do experience it as um, it's really flattering and humbling, and because um, you know the irony is of course that I'm not rich and famous by any stretch of the imagination, and I suppose it's true I have been pretty influential on you know a couple of genres really, mm -hmm. um, and I feel really really proud of that. I guess I've always I've never been interested in being the best at what I do I'm interested in being like the only one who does what I do and so mm -hmm. that it's ended up this way where I'm not really a part of any particular scene but my fingerprints are on a few of them uh mm -hmm. I'm into that I like it I like it I didn't plan it but but I'm I'm grateful I mean I think that just shows the the, the how great you are as a songwriter I mean to be able to kind of influence I, wow. so many different genres I mean everything like from a band like Thursday to you know yeah. uh Deftones or Yep. link or whoever else i mean jimmy world i mean there's so many different layers in I mean, there yeah thursday people. deftones blink dashboard dashboard frank turner jimmy <laughs> world uh i mean i remember frank turner coming out to one of my one line drawing shows in 2001 or two and his band million oh better just broken up and he was just starting to do solo stuff and 
Um, yeah, there's just a long, long, long line of <laughs> artists that have opened for me and gone on to be way bigger than me. Um, but and, still, like, that's so crazy. No, no, I, no, that's what I'm saying is like, I don't, there's nothing but joy for that, truly, because <laughs> I don't, I mean, for a lot of reasons, I don't think I'm necessarily built for that level, that scale of fame. Um, mm -hmm. it, it takes a certain kind of whatever, but it's true. I think it's fitting that we're doing something for American Songwriter because I was just talking with one of my best friends about this, actually. If there's one thing I'm proud of in this life, it's that I've written a bunch of tunes. I've said my piece. They're incredibly different. So I, I can't think of a songwriter, honestly, and this is going to sound really wild, but I would love to hear from people. I can't think of a songwriter who's done legitimate output in as many different genres as I have from super heavy shit mm -hmm. to super soft bedroom emo indie shit to really silly shit. Like really, it's, it's really all over the place when I look back on it. And so again, it's not about that I'm better than anyone else, but I, I can't, I can't think of other artists that have fucked with the, the range that I have. And I'm, I, I, think I that's can't what think I of either. As you're talking, I'm trying to like, like reel in my head, like, okay, let me think now. But even like the, some of the newer songs are then you've, you've put out what three songs that are going to be. Well, for, I saw the track listening to the new record and I only saw two of the oh, three cool. that you have out. And yeah, yeah with someone on the internet I, I think that song is i i love all three of them that one i, I was going to talk to you about the video i was watching Thank about it you. which is so so cool uh but that even has kind of like the there's like some production like electronic production in that song too so it's like yeah, you're even I, in that world a little bit now totally and i've been i've been it's funny i've been really messing someone on the internet in particular which i, I just want to say first of all thank you for picking out that tune i know it's just like a weird little b-side but for me the b-sides of artists so i love are sometimes the the coolest things and mm -hmm. i'm really proud of that tune uh from from the lyric to the production to, I, I just really i'm a fan so thank you thank you thank you and the video oh, too man. i was so psyched when it came up with that idea and did it it's um, so cool. I like just you just oh, to, cool. to, to you know to I, I I'll let you keep going. Sorry, and then I'm gonna talk about how. No, no, no. Uh, I, love, I love no, no. Please, I love conversations no, like this. Yeah. You no, know, I just wanted to say like for people that are are watching this that haven't seen the video, like it's you know it's like a text. You're texting essentially your yourself, or it looks like you're texting right. with somebody else. But the name it's one line drawing right. as the the recipient of the text. And the yeah. way you do it is so cool. And like when Thank it's the, mu the music part, it's like the three dots, like waiting for the person yes. to type. Yes. And then like when the chorus hits, everything's in capital letters. I'm like, this is so good. Like the, oh. it was executed perfectly. <laughs> Man, I, just as a songwriter, I just dream of moments when at least one fucking human in the world like <laughs> gets what I was going for. And you just, I'm so happy that it got straight to you, man. I really Thank am. You. I just, uh, cause no, I love this stuff. And I just like, I, that song in particular was an incredibly insular fun song for me to do. And the video, I had the idea and it was, and I've always been really enamored of whatever the sound is in my head, or in this case, the kind of the visual idea in my head, I mean, I love working with other people and I love collaboration. It's so wonderful. And there's something about just in that Prince kind of way, like doing it myself and mm -hmm. figure out how to make that little video and do it and turn it around in like 48 hours was such a thrilling time. And again, I don't know whether anyone else is ever going to give a shit about it, but I'm so proud of it. So I'm just really happy that you. I like hope it. people do because it's <laughs> such a cool I and the song that. itself is awesome. But then you because I, I was listening to the song. Yeah, I was listening to it on Spotify. I'm like, this is a rad song. And then I just end up Googling it. I'm like, okay, like, how come it's not on the track listening for the record? Like, am I missing something here? And then I saw the video pop up. I'm like, okay, I'm gonna make sure this is this the same thing. And I'm like watching right. it. I'm like, this is so brilliant. <laughs> ah, cool, man. Yeah, I um yeah, it's and it's cool, like, yeah, it's weird that it's not on the record, but in the same way, I don't know. Again, I love artists that have I don't, uh, I don't like contrived mystery. I don't like contrived sort of, I'm going to be obtuse to be weird or something. Mm -hmm. I've really never enjoyed that, but I really enjoy the idiosyncrasy of everyone just being themselves. And so if I am just the animal I am doing what I love, then it's going to come out in fits and starts. It's going to be a little confusing sometimes. Like, wait, what, what, where's this track from? Why, that, why does it sound like that? But that one sounded like that. 
I, as a listener, love getting into an artist and, you know, I find one, you know, get, I'll go back to Prince because I just love Prince so much, mm -hmm. but not because I'm trying to be Prince, but this idea that, you know, I could, I think the first Prince song I really remember hearing and having stuck in my head was Delirious. Okay. And, you know, I get delirious whenever you're near. You know, it's kind of like Elvisy thing almost. Mm -hmm. What the fuck is even happening right now? <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's just like this carnival thing. And I'm in high school. I'm like, what the fuck is this guy on about? But then, you know, I, don't, I forget, you know, for the next track I heard was When Doves Cry. You know, and then the mm -hmm. next, you know, it just, I mean, and then there's 1990. Oh, wait, he, he did DMSR? Oh, wait, he did what? That? Oh, yeah, shit. Yeah, Let's Go Crazy. You know, like, there's so many. Yeah, his, like, Let's yeah. Go Crazy. I mean. And so it's, you know, it's an old story now with Prince. Uh, and for those of us that are nerds, we, we know all the subtlety of it. But the point is, artists like him, Neil Young, Bowie, Zeppelin, uh, Sinead O'Connor, uh, the Sugar mm -hmm. Cubes, and then Bjork, um, Ricky Lee Jones, Miles Davis. I'm interested in humans that confuse the fuck out of me, but I know they're not trying to confuse me. They're just being who they are. And mm -hmm. that to me is the most thrilling thing. And so that's all if there's any kevin seconds is the more recent he's a friend of mine but he's someone mm -hmm. who's just always followed his muse and i that is the tradition that i believe myself to be in whether anyone else does or not that's what i'm going for like that's mm -hmm. i don't consider it my competition or their you know i'm their competition but if there's anyone that i want to be in the same room with it's people like that like the popularity part and the song craft i'm down I, you know I'm grateful for all of it. But if I can be a weird little animal on this earth doing what I'm supposed to be doing, I don't know. I feel like it's done there. <laughs> I love that. I love it. And those are great references. I mean, yeah. I mean, Prince, obviously. And I was, I was just thinking of him when you're talking. Like, I, I didn't realize this, but uh, he his song, Darling Nikki, I think is the reason why there's parental yeah. advisory stickers on on CDs. Yeah, isn't that crazy? Like, yeah, <laughs> to be the yeah. guy of of all people, you think it's not NWA or it's not like you know some like super you know that's what I'm the talking power type about, person. Right? It's Prince is right. the reason why you have a parental advisory sticker. It's big. Well, because Prince is, and by the way, I will. I'll, I'll just go. Back. I, I know it was just an aside, but I, like for me, Public Enemy was doing a very different thing than NWA was doing a very different thing than Prince. And mm -hmm. where, and I prefer, like Nation of Millions is one of my very, very favorite records of all time. And that, that era of hip hop, I would say before Gangster Rap basically, where there was a lot of, there was a lot of thought put into it and hip hop had matured enough that it was a real mainstream voice of youth situation going on. But there was still some, uh, uh, the kind of the macho hadn't entirely taken over yet. There was still mm -hmm. some vulnerability in there. Um, KRS One from Boogie Down Productions, Edutainment oh, sure. for anyone who likes old school hip hop. Um, just there's a song called "Love's Gonna Get You" that is just uh, one of the most vulnerable, interesting hip hop songs ever. And what I love, and why I think I'm a Prince guy and a Public Enemy guy, but not necessarily an NWA guy. With all respect to them, for sure. I mean Dre's production, especially, um, and I suppose Ice Cube's phrasing too. I can't, I can't fuck front on that. But all that said. I'm a vulnerability guy. I like when people kind of show you their weak spots. Um, and what I think is so cool that Darling Nikki was prompted it is because it's one thing to be all bravado and boasty and violent, but to say, like, just to talk about a woman you met in the hotel hallway masturbating with a magazine or whatever, you know? <laughs> yeah, like, sure. whoa, just like, whoa, that's an intense line to start with, man. Right. <laughs> and, and I feel like that's a thing that, like, it's almost like the sensitive delivery of it is what makes it so obscene or whatever, you know, right. because that shit's dangerous. Like, mm -hmm. it's one thing to, like, the mock violence. We've got that in our culture. But when a man who's you can't like is very gender obscure and race obscured and like this weird little creature is talking about a woman masturbating in the first bars of a tune after like the shredding, you know, like I mean, it just the whole thing is like, OK, you know, and that's what I'm going for. It's right. it's, it's it's really it's uh, it's I want that level of vulnerability. I want um I'll bring another person into this, a totally other okay. kind of human, but there's a guy called, uh, an artist called Smog. Um, okay, I haven't heard Smog. I'm blanking on it. Yeah, I'm blanking on his name right now. Uh, 
But anyway, really cool songwriter, but he's got a record called Red Apple Falls. Um, that you should definitely check out. It's some really pure songwriting. And the, <laughs> the first line, I believe on the first track of the album, with the, which is called To Be Of Use, the first line is, most of my fantasies are of making someone else come. <laughs> it's, like, it's like what um, yeah. so and and again it doesn't to me come off as at all like i'm shoving this in your face or anything like i'm trying to get you to feel this right um which again whether it's political artistry or or you know the intense violence stuff which is well, wonderful as well um or the sensitive stuff when it's someone trying to get me to feel a feeling i couldn't give a fuck but mm -hmm. when it's someone expressing their feelings and letting me into that that's the good shit you know and so that's what that. i'm after um that these are these are my inspirations yeah that's incredible i so i was when i was typing i was just writing in the <laughs> the names of the songs so i could go back and you know the oh, hell yeah, one hell song. Yeah. yeah like so i, I was like oh yeah I haven't, I, I, i'd have to make sure because i know chaos one but i don't know i wouldn't be able to pick out a song title off the top of my head totally. so I was like, i'm gonna go back and then it, i typed totally. in that smog record which i've i found it looks like it it was like from late 90s so hopefully yep. that's the one yep Cool. Yeah, no, no, it's it's what yeah, there's, there's only one later. of those. Yeah. Smog, Red Apple Falls to be of use, and uh Karis or really boogie down productions, edutainment, yeah. love's gonna get you. Um those those two whole records are pretty insane. There's also a smog tune on that record called Robot by the River that's like it's one of the better couplets I can think of. And I I'll I'll probably mangle it right now, but it's something about like going to his girlfriend's house and feeling like a criminal casing the joint. <laughs> um and and then go like uh when i'm like when i'm out on the street when i'm out in the world i feel like a robot by the river looking for a drink you know and you, mm -hmm. it takes you a second they're like oh yeah because robots drink oil fuck they don't drink water <laughs> and it's just like this re it's just a brilliant brilliant line and just so yeah it's full of them but i i just love a couplet like that man i just whew, yeah that's cool. Yeah, I, I've got those both. I just typed them in just so I can go check them out. <laughs> Appreciate that, man. Time. I enjoy it. Spread the word. Yeah, yeah I love I just, it. I just, songs are the best. Songs are the best. For sure. Well, I have one more quick uh, sidebar oh, yeah. question or side note question before Great. we get Great. into you. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay, so I, an, another thing I found when I was doing some research on you is, and I don't know if this is, if this is, if I'm going to be totally off and you're going to be like, no, you're dumb. Uh, but okay, I love this. TED Talk. Did you do a TED yeah. Talk? Was I it did, at, a little TEDx, yeah. Yeah, was it at Rancho uh, Bernardo High School? Oh, this is such a great circle. The same woman that got me onto that TED Talk is the backyard that I was supposed to play. That's oh, my God. I'm so happy this all happened. Okay, yes. holy. Yes. Okay, so what's crazy is I, gr I grew up in Rancho Penisquitos, which is like right. a stone's throw from there. And yeah. uh, I actually live closer to the RB side. So like my neighbor across the street, she went to Rancho Marano High School and I went to the other yeah. high school. Uh, but like I saw, they said RB high and I'm watching it and nobody addresses there that you're at. Like, I don't even think you said it in the, in the performance that you're like, oh, I'm, like, I'm, thanks RB high. Like it just kind of happens. And then the, whoever edited it, like slit the front off of the girl talking and then the end. So I'm like, is this Ranch Bernardo High School? And I'm like <laughs> typing in Google, doing this like deep dive of like, is this like really him at RV in San Diego? <laughs> I love that. Oh my God, I'm totally going to tell Brick about that. Yeah, that's so I mean, awesome. I, so it was, it was an RV. Okay, that's so cool. Yeah, to this day. And God, there's such, there's some really neat circles happening in this conversation, which I tend to pay attention to. So thank you for the symmetry and the synchronicity. Um, of course. I, um, it's really neat because I believe I played the first backyard show at that place in Poway or Poway. I don't know. How Poway, say it. yeah. Um, Poway. Poway. Um, and also, I was going down to do that, the, the TED thing and the backyard thing and probably a couple other shows. But right before then is when Prince died. And that's oh, why wow. at the beginning of that, I'm talking about like, I kind of want to just do this whole thing about Prince, even though I had this whole other idea planned because. You it had a shirt a on. For me. It was the first thing that you mentioned. Yes, you're like, exactly. yeah, you're like, I've That's got exactly this right. print shirt on. Yeah. 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 It was, um, and because I think it was, it was something like, I think the, the theme was sort of minds on fire or something like that, or whatever the, the sort of the theme I was supposed to address was. And I was like, 
Prince would be the perfect person for this and I could talk forever about it, but I'm going to do this other thing. But yeah, so that was me mourning Prince um, during that wow. thing. So I love that you brought up that weird little TED Talk thing. Yeah. That's so cool. That's so cool. Yeah. I, I was like, yeah. I'm like, this is either he's going to say, yeah, that was totally me. Or you're going to be like, what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> yeah. No, no. Like, with me, I swear with me the weird, the weird, yeah, no. The weird thing that you're probably not sure happened or heard what maybe was a rumor is probably true when it comes to me because <laughs> there's been there's been a lot of weird tales over the last 25 years of doing this shit, man. So I yeah. appreciate you. Yeah. Well, I think that's so cool. And it's crazy to think, I'm sure you know the Blink guys and like their whole tie to that RB and all that too, because they're from Poway. That's where the band started. And then Oh, wow. Is, yeah. So the band formed there and the original drummer, Scott Rayner, went to Ranch Bernardo High School where he did that TED Talk. And Tom met him when he got kicked out of huh. high school because he showed up to a basketball game drunk. So Tom got sent to RB High, and that's when he started jamming with Scott yeah. Rayner and Blink formed. Isn't that is so you were I in love your deep dive -ness. That's your, <laughs> You were killing it on the deep dive. And that probably does go. I've always actually wondered. I mean, I love that Blink likes what I do, and they've been uh, like one or the other of them has been quite complimentary over the years. Of um, I remember a tune that I'd written with my friend Norman that ended up on a, the last bar record. Um, I believe it was, I want to say it was Tom hopped on. It, I think he did a tweet or something like, like, this is the song of the year. And I was like, mm -hmm. fuck man. Like that, like, cause I really respect them as songwriters, like deeply. Sure. Um, and uh, so I've always wondered about sort of when they found out, but hearing that they've got such roots there makes kind of sense to me actually hearing that. Mm -hmm. That's cool. Yeah, yeah no, that's, that's yeah, that's their spot. So like, that's they're cool. the band I, I always that. grew up to, and then th yeah, I love it's that. just the whole thing. Seeing the, the how they blow up, I was like, oh my god, like this is just right? it blew my mind when they're on like on MTV and stuff. Uh, but this isn't about them either. Those, so <laughs> those songs could not be stopped, man. Those songs could not uh -uh. be stopped, man. Unreal, it's, unreal. The 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 uh, I I'm a person who when I'm asked for like top ten songs or whatever or artists or whatever, I can do that and it's fun, but I tend to. For me, music especially is about moments. Mm -hmm. And so I often will give sort of my top 10 moments in my head. And one of the top, one of the top pop song craft things for me is how you get to that first chorus. Like, and I want it to feel like an inevitable tumble into the chorus. Mm -hmm. um, I would say that in the last, whatever, I guess how many years has it been now? Since Call Me, Call Me Maybe is the last yeah, that was like tumble ooh. into a chorus. Yeah, um, twenty. It's two thousand twelve or something. It starts. I no it starts, and you're just on this train to the chorus, and you cannot stop it. And when the <laughs> chorus hits you, you're dead. Um, <laughs> and but but one of the one of the most perfect examples of that craft is uh, what's my age again? Mm -hmm. That that from the beginning, from the opening moments of that song into the chorus is just pop perfection i just it, love it it really is that whole album yeah. how that yeah. just just solidified oh. them as like one of the biggest bands ever is so unreal to think about it it makes perfect sense that that like it's it reminds me of dookie in that way like this kind of like oh, yeah these songs i don't care how scruffy these bands are like these songs are for the world right. um yeah that's another yeah that's a great example of an of a band that just yeah took it totally to the next next level but, okay, oh my god i love nerding out with you okay yeah no this has been so fun already like i know we haven't even talked about you yet i, I know i know i know okay okay let's do this okay let's well, do this no no Focus. no this is great as long, as long as you got time oh, i got plenty good, so good. i'm in okay great 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 me too, me too. So, all right cool cool so are you tell me born and raised in massachusetts is that what i read yeah, that's true. Uh, okay. Born, uh, born, like came home from the hospital to a house in Cambridge, a crazy ass hippie house. Uh, dad left, and then it was me and mom and sis moved to Mission Hill, which was a really, really fucking tough area at that time. Mm -hmm. So basically, a lot of poverty and insanity up until like nine years old, and then got to a place called Brookline. Um, which is now like a really rich suburb but at the time was just like a great public school kind of like leg up um mm -hmm. that, where my life kind of settled down so i boston you know in that way that wherever you grew up around boston boston's your hometown so boston's sure. my hometown right. um yeah for sure for sure for sure yeah 
Yeah. Okay. So, girl, yeah, growing up there, you said it was rough until what you're about nine. You moved into a little better of a neighborhood. Yeah, like just so we we got out of we got out of like abject poverty and chaos and into okay. yeah, good public school system. Um, just just kind of a it's really when the main memories of my life begin. I think up okay. till then was just a little kind of too crazy uh, to sure. to kind of retain. Yeah. But yes, that around third grade is when I kind of settled into being alive or something like that, mm-hmm. because it's, it's sort of, uh, yeah. And, and uh, maybe unsurprisingly, I grew up around a lot of music. My parents didn't play, but th- again, there's a lot of hippies around playing guitars and stuff. And I think I have the feeling that that was a really comforting part of my life. And it's, it probably really got into my body that just sharing music is a, is a way to have some safety. Mm-hmm. Um, and so not long after I got to Brookline, I mean, I just took to music classes so quickly and not necessarily the theory part, but just, I remember that, I remember, uh, remember that tune, uh, I caramba cried don gato. It's like this weird kid song about a cat. I don't uh, remember that song. No. That, I remember that one and, and Charlie and the MTA. I don't remember that one. Uh, but I, all these choruses, basically, I think I first learned how special a chorus was to me, like this thing mm-hmm. that could stick in my head and kind of give me a little bit of an escape from the world, but also let me feel my feelings a little more. Mm-hmm. Um, it really got to me. Um, so yeah, so that's when all that started was when I got to Brooklyn. When you start, you said you were in music classes. Was that for, like, what was the first instrument or were you in like no, we're chorus ta- classes? Yeah, we're talking about like whatever the most basic ass music class is. Okay. Like that's oh, okay. what it was. I, sure. remember, I remember learning tunes on the recorder. Um, oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I think I tried cello for a hot minute, but could not hang. Um, yeah, I, and then I took guitar lessons sometime. I think, I, yeah, I don't exactly know what happened. One weird thing that happened actually is that uh, the people that I bought my first electric guitar and amplifier from were actually filmmakers, uh, Barbara uh, and Barry Kagan. Um, they were making a, a, they wanted to work on a documentary about young people in rock and roll Mm -hmm. and they kind of became enamored of me. And so they ended up, uh, the working title for the movie, which I don't think was ever finished was called Jonah Wales, uh, with the the whole pun of W A I L S. Um, and, uh, and so I've never seen footage from it, but I remember shooting it and being so, you know, happy. Uh, we did it with a band called the Dogmatics, this Boston punk band. And oh, I know, so I anyway, know the long... name. Yeah. Oh I shit, know that. that's so cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I do know the name, um, the Dogmatics. They've got a, they've got a couple of, but one record is called Thayer Street, and another one. Oh God, is what? What is it called? I don't know, but it's a really brilliant record. And the first track on it is called Shit House, um, <laughs> and it's just one of the most, oh, feral blasts of of punk pop you'll ever fucking hear um so anyway the long story short i think what i'm trying to say is that i i never got good at playing the guitar um i i consider myself a sort of a working man singer where i've really i've really fought for every note that i've learned to sing um i never really had a ton of natural ability but man did i love songs and i knew my way around a chorus i knew what a hook was Bef- way before I knew much else about music I just knew something and I was I was just talking to my buddy Zach about one of the first songs I ever wrote it was called Communication and it's so sweet because the chorus is please come talk to me all I need is communication don't leave me standing on my own all I need is communication so don't leave me here alone and that was I think all I was trying to do and I think all I'm still trying to do with music mm-hmm. um, is a convey that thing and not leave someone else alone and not be left alone and also uh the the, please come talk to me because all i need is communication don't leave me standing on my own because all i need is communication so don't leave me here alone and so like I can wow, still remember that was the that first being, song you wrote. <laughs> That's crazy. I mean, it's one of them. There's a lot yeah, of there's a lot of little beasties back then. But no, I mean, but they all had hooks. You know, they all had 
they all had these very plaintive sentiments and and these these little hooks and i just love that i can still remember it all these years later mm -hmm. i kind of have come to think of songs these weird little guideposts for my life and so when i think of being 15 and playing in the talent show that's what i think of um so i think that's what i fell in love with like so when you ask about what instrument did i learn i again i i did guitar lessons for a hot minute i hated carrying my electric guitar i was a tiny little person <laughs> And I would carry this fucking Fender Music Master, and it was so heavy. It was like as heavy as I was. And I remember really hating that. And Boston winters sucked. Uh, and mm -hmm. but I remember I being oh my god, it was the worst. Um, and but I remembered asking the guy I wanted to learn Ramble on by Led Zeppelin. Mm -hmm. And when the guitar teacher told me that there was a lot of layering going on and it was really hard to actually learn that song. I think I was like, oh, well, what the fuck am I doing in guitar lessons? Because that's what I want to do right. is I want to make this this mood that Ramble On is. I, I don't know, whatever that takes. And so then I think I got my first four track and I consider my first instrument, the first instrument that I really fell in love with is a four track. Like that's my instrument. Is that what kind of, because a lot of your um, obviously one line drowning stuff, like bedroom recordings, is that kind of where 100%. that all came out of? I, I, Yes. I mean, I grew up on, you know, I mean, I was in Boston mm -hmm. in, well, shit, I went to high school, you know, 84 to 87. So from, you know, when did I get, I got into Boston, maybe in like 79, I guess, or something like that. Is that right? Yeah. 79. So from 79 to 87, I'm in Boston, Massachusetts. I mean, the cars, the mm -hmm. band, Boston, Aerosmith, um, there's just and then down to like mission of burma money money bostones mm -hmm. um there's like just some astonishing shit happening um and then because of the college rock community in boston and bcn and being mm -hmm. sort of the the like torchbearers of fm radio i grew up surrounded by not only all the bands from my area but also um the U2 broke in Boston, the police broke in Boston. I mean, endless bands mm -hmm. found their footing in the United States where I was growing up. And That's so cool. The, yeah, the impact that it had on me as a kid was massive. So I loved all that rock and roll. But honestly, it was Suzanne Vega's first record. Um, and I think Tracy Chapman's first record where I really started to dream a little bigger about what I could do because I could make noises like that in my house. Mm -hmm. I couldn't really do that with Zeppelin, for instance, right. you know, um, sure. it, it was just too much for my brain, but I could do me and a guitar. Mm -hmm. And I think there was something that I, that I fell in love with that I've really never gotten over. I, you know, I, I just, it's still my heart of hearts is just, can you give it to me on a guitar? Can you give it to me with you and a voice and maybe an instrument? Mm -hmm. and that's where my love is it just yeah it's so that's so exactly it, how i yeah. feel like i love this like like if i hear a song and it's really good i'm like i want to hear that a, a, has anyone done an acoustic version of this or can i find this person singing the song acoustic elsewhere because it's usually like right. for me it's even a better version <laughs> usually, well, so usually. To, cir to circle back to someone on the internet actually um that started out um, and actually, just just because we're we're buds now, um, <laughs> I will uh, I will make sure you get to I'll send you the very the initial demo of me doing someone on the Internet. Um, wow. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I would I'd really love to just as a just as a music person. Um, and so what it turned into is actually kind of like a high octane, strange situation that, yeah, it's got some electronic in it mm -hmm. and some like super like heavy duty pop punk guitars and it's all mashed up and crazy. Um, and that's wonderful and I love it. But what mm -hmm. I really love is that I can play that song on acoustic guitar. It's essentially one chord progression the whole way through and it's a full piece and I mm -hmm. really back it. Um, so that's cool. I'd love it, to hear uh, that. I love the yeah. drums that come in, like the, like the roll yes, that comes in yes, really quickly yeah, yeah, and then it gets yeah. loud, but I'd love to hear what it sounds. Yeah. Acoustic. That's so cool. Yeah. So, and just to, just to get a little nerdy about the production of that one, um, those yeah that single stroke roll was a very specific request uh, uh like the the drummer we were working with on that session um i said whatever you do give me a long ass single stroke roll into <laughs> yeah. that i just need i need that it's one of my favorite things in the world um and then 
but the the kind of halftime almost hip hop loopy sounding thing that's the drums for that first chorus when everything mm -hmm. drops out and you hear the first chorus that actually was an experiment that one of the guys i was working on the track with he had thrown that in way at the end of the song on that very last do you still get depressed when the sun is about to set kind mm -hmm. of thing at the very end of the track he had it way at the end and i was like nah that's too cute a hook and so i like requested that he send me the drum stems and the guitar stems and i basically rebuilt the song um in a way wow. that was entirely unintended so that's again what i love is taking the elements of a song and kind of do, like ripping it apart and getting to the heart of it i just mm -hmm. really enjoy that process so that happened i really love that you brought up that song because that's the most specific example of of what i love to do in a song that has happened in a while actually because it was super lo-fi into mm -hmm. super hi-fi and now it's kind of this weird mess of in between and that's my favorite yeah. it's such a cool song though again yeah i mean yeah, i, I want to talk just, about the new one's a new record but yeah that no, one is when I, I had to do the deep one. dive. I'm yeah, like, what's no, going on here? How come I'm not seeing this? Look, in my heart of hearts, that's the fucking, that's the one that goes to number one. I don't care. Like in this age of the internet, frankly, you never know. So um, right. that song, I want, I just, to me, I just love making songs and then seeing where they want to go in the world. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, let's talk about some other shit because yeah, no, that connected <laughs> to me. I'm just saying, no, that's so cool. So, well, so you started off with a four track and you recording songs in your bedroom, but when do you, you said you're in a talent show at 15 or so, like, do you have a band at this point or were you just kind of coming out as I'm going to play no, my no, songs? No, 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 I was, I was in, yeah, I was in bands first. Um, okay. We, the first thing I can remember was a, the sixth grade talent show and covering a Stones tune or Chuck Berry song but that we knew because the Stones had covered it on a record mm -hmm. called 12 by 5, a song called Oh Carol. And okay. I was so desperate, apparently, to be Mick Jagger or something that all the people who were listening thought I was singing Oh Cow, Don't Let Them Steal Your Heart Away. Um, and so that was the sixth grade talent show, was doing a Stones cover and and um and then the next thing i remember was playing the eighth grade graduation there was a classical pianist and a, and a violinist i believe and then we came on and ripped into a cover of purple haze <laughs> except i had uh, uh oh no yeah purple haze. and then oh no, no the real thing was we we did a cover of good times bad times okay. uh for which i rewrote all of the lyrics to be about the school um and there was something in going to the second chorus where I made a joke about the cafeteria food. I don't know what they're serving, but it smells like horse back there. Ah, oh, good times, bad times. <laughs> um, so, so this was my life. This was my life is doing these weird things. And then I remember with my friend Zach getting into the talent show. Uh, I believe it was our freshman year in high school and just being over the moon that our little band, uh, I think we were called Turbulence then. Uh, had gotten into the talent show. And by then I was writing original music. Um, okay. uh, so I think the original music started around sixth grade. Um, but then freshman year is the first time I believe I was performing full on original songs. Um, was that scary and, or not at all? <clears throat> Honestly, I was such a fucking mess back then. Like, and I, you know, I don't say this for it to be hyperbolic, but again the beginning of my life was not great and by the time music was it really was a, a it really was a savior for me mm -hmm. um so i think that self-consciousness that i think a lot of people experience i really i, I the only thing i can think of was that it the importance of it for me outweighed any sense of stage fright um okay. it was just i was just get like i was surviving i did mm -hmm. not know which way was up um i was trying to be little man of the house without my dad around i had my mom and my sister i was in a new town um i was processing in whatever weird little way i was pressing this crazy early life mm -hmm. and so yeah no i don't think i was really scared um okay. i but not because i'm fearless i'm effectively a very fearful person at times Mm -hmm. But music for me is an incredibly, incredibly sacred place. Making songs, I truly think, saved my life. I do. Mm -hmm. I do. I, 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 I can't say enough about the process of writing songs 
and how therapeutic that was for me. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, yeah. like the vulnerability that comes across in, in your songs, a lot of your songs, and even it, yeah. with the far songs that you, 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 were, you sure. were writing back then. Sure. I mean, was that something that you have always been, you know, comfortable doing? Like, like you talk about yeah. that first show in ninth grade, like, were you that vulnerable, especially with your own, you know, life and, you know, lyrics? I mean, like I say, I mean, the, the, the lyric, not that, not that a lot of kids haven't written angsty little lonely songs. So, but yeah, I mean, you know, the lyrics I led with, I believe our opening track was, I sit at home another day. I sit at home just wasting away. I'm so confused in this life of mine. And it's just a lie when I say I'm fine. Why can't I relate to all my family and friends? Will I ever relate to society? Will my isolation ever end? And then there's oh that, my gosh. please come talk to me because all I need is communication. Oh, yeah. um, and then, you know, the another song I did was called Get It Off Your Back. That was, um, gosh, it was about vulnerability. Um, so the second verse was... Uh, these 80s pharmaceutics stronger than the street drugs make all the rich old ladies happy little human slugs, but it's all right <laughs> oh my for them. Gosh. I know, but it's all right for them because doctors know best. And if the pills don't get finished, then they'll swallow the rest. Um, they tell us we need it, what professionals, but what we really need is more confessionals. Get it off your back. Don't keep it inside. Because if you hold it back, you're going to blow wide open someday. Like what? Like, oh my, like that, that could have been written like literally two years ago and it would still make sense now. I know. <laughs> Isn't like that that's wild? me. That's 15 year old me. I like another track called Murder by Suicide, which is like at the time it all ended, like the break of a thread. They were at the table, father knows best at the head, talking us so lightly about the events of the day. Uh young junior, he fucked up again. Again he went astray and he could not live up to their expectations. Talks with the doctor ended in frustration. He would never be hopeful i think he would never be sure it was a terminal illness for which there was no cure because it was murder by suicide that's what the doctor said it was murder by suicide because it all goes straight to your head i mean what the fuck <laughs> that's like, so awesome so, so that's me that's me at 14 and 15 oh like that's, my gosh and and i don't think that ever ended really i i would like to think that it got you know the sentiment got more refined and i learned to write tunes a little bit better but ultimately it's really just me yeah, I mean, cut to far the songs. I mean, oh my gosh. I just, I loved my bars from the very early age. I really, I don't know, man. I don't, it's really sweet to talk about this right now. But yeah, so that that thread continued right on in to certainly my solo stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, I would say to your point, I started doing the solo thing sort of towards the end of the high school. I, me and my buddy Ari started a thing called Missing Cat. It was like kind of an acoustic Indigo Boys kind of duo thing. Okay. And uh, we covered we covered REM at our high school graduation, and um, uh, I think we covered time after time Annalise off a of reckoning. Um, mm-hmm. And we were and we were writing original songs that were really cool, and these kind of you know these kind of Simon and Garfunkel meets the Pretenders kind of songs or something. Um, and then I but I was still mostly into bands in high school and I was in bands in college, but I got really into the solo songwriter deal in college. And then when I got to far, I, all I knew was that I loved my tunes, but I wanted to find a really intense rock band that wanted not a typical rock singer that wanted more of a songwriterly approach to Mm -hmm. rock songs. Um, and so they would have the riffs and I would bring lyrics, melodies, choruses, hooks. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's what we did. That's what we did in FAR. Um, it was a total car crash in a lot of ways, but a really beautiful one that yielded some, some powerful moments. And I think when we hit our stride, sort of, I would say, you know, 94 or five to 99, I think we, I think we made some really unique uh, and yeah, I guess ultimately influential, innovative rock music. Mm-hmm. Yeah, sure. Yeah, no, mm-hmm. totally. You went to college in Claremont, California. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So you moved from Boston. What took you to to California? I think uh, well, two things. One was probably just being as far away from home as possible. Uh, okay. No, n- nothing but love for mom and sis. But I think again, I, I was uh, I'd been through a lot, and sure. I think I just wanted to figure out something else um Mm -hmm. i had done a 
mountain of drugs in high school and then gotten sober at the end of high school. So I think I wanted to also kind of like start a whole new situation. Sure. And also, um, I had found a place of solace in a thing called School Within a School, which was part of Brookline High, a kind of a, a little um, subset of 100 kids, a lottery system thing where kind of the weirdos would, would get funneled off to. Um, and uh, so I really found that I enjoyed smaller groups of people um, and a smaller scale was kind of easier on my constitution. Um, and so Pitzer, the college I went to, mm -hmm. uh, was I think 750 kids at the time wow. and the whole Claremont College consortium you know the five schools Pitzer, Pomona, mm -hmm. Claremont, McKenna, Harvey, Mudd, Scripps um, what I think the total student body was 5,000 amongst all the five colleges so it was a scale that really fit for me um, mm -hmm. oh and also but yeah it was also the, the only college with accreditation uh, that I could find that didn't require me to do um more math and science and stuff oh brilliant uh, that's what i yeah that's how it was i got the my only degree. one <laughs> exactly it was the only place where i could just skip straight to english and art and shit like i didn't have to fuck with the the general ed anymore i was like i'm good i don't need to know any more math and science i just want to learn about other stuff so that i think those are the those are the selling points far away that, tiny and i could do what the fuck i wanted yeah that's that so it. funny that was my thing when i went to college i'm like so i suck at math and science what can i yeah. do they're like <laughs> Communications. I'm like, there we go. <laughs> and now we're back to my first song being called Communication. Yeah, there you go. Uh, yeah. uh, oh, wow. Totally, totally. It's exactly right. It's exactly Just on right. a quick note, yeah. are you still, did yeah. you stay sober or do you? I mean, I, I, I like I like my weed. Okay. Um, I, I basically was stone cold sober from 16 to about 36. Took about wow. 20 years off. That's great. And I just, it was great. It was a, it was a godsend for me. I really needed to get my shit together. Um, I was on probation, like things were not going well. And, and my dad was busy drinking himself to death down in Florida. And I mm -hmm. was seeing that kind of play out. And I was like, okay, so this is my hand of cards. I can't seem to do this without getting in a shit ton of trouble. My dad's killing himself. This is not for me. And mm -hmm. I, I considered it a deep moment of grace. And again, where music saved me. I think if I hadn't had music to run to, to kind of deal with all the feelings I was having when I quit drugs and didn't have, you know, cause drugs are to, they're to medicate something. Sure. Yeah. And I had a lot going on. And so without them, I was feeling my emotions returning um, and kind of really feeling feelings for the first time in my life um, at around, you know, 16. Mm -hmm. And which is already a time when we're feeling a lot of feelings. Yeah, um, for sure. So, yeah, so I got sober then. I, I was so grateful to go through college sober. I saw all these other kids like blowing all their fucking parents' money and kind of destroying themselves. Mm -hmm. And I was so happy that I'd kind of gotten over that stage of it. And then shit, early in rock and roll and being on tour, tour, when I started touring was the first time I realized, A, how attractive drugs could be because mm -hmm. if there's ever a place that's fun to do drugs it's on fucking tour but it's also the place that i was the most grateful that i was sober because again i saw deeply talented wonderful human beings destroying themselves mm -hmm. and there were people having much more success than me and i thought how can how can i be happier than them if they're having all this success and so I thought about two things. I thought about high level success and maybe it's not all it's cracked up to be because it seems, looks a little stressful. Mm -hmm. And two, sobriety is really, really important, especially when you're carrying a large load. It's it, because I had to have all my wits about me, I think, to, to stay sane. Um, mm -hmm. So my dream was always that, or not my dream, my question was always, can I get to be a grown up and then revisit drugs and have fun with them and not have it be a crutch and not have it be an escape, um, a, a kind of a self destructive thing? Mm -hmm. And what I found in my mid 30s was like, yeah, I can smoke some weed and that feels really sweet. I still love psychedelics from time to time. That feels really sweet. Um, opiates never came back for me. Alcohol never came back for me. I haven't had a drink or an opiate in. Well, whatever, since I was 16. Yeah. Wow. Um, yeah. So that never came back. But the more what I and what I learned is that 
kind of predictable, like the more expansive kind of substances I'm curious about. Sure. The more restrictive kind of like numbing substances, those aren't really for me. Yeah. Well, That's I don't only, and yeah. I, I appreciate you sharing that with me. I only ask because yeah, cool. I, uh, cool. uh, yeah, I, similar to you, I stop. well, I'm not similar, just in the sense that I quit drinking five years ago but i fell into just why Congrats, that's man. why those lyrics like held so deep to me with your the song lyrics about the doctors and the the, the, the drugs and stuff is because i've had four cervical surgeries and i had fell into that whole opiate ah, pandemic, you know, academic man. you know and then finally you know i thought i was like i don't drink so i'm good you know same th then fell into that shit and then so on and so forth uh but you know i'm in recovery now i Stop smoking, doing everything about in January of this year, but like, yeah, I cut all good, the other good, shit out, good. like, you know, years ago. And then now I'm like trying to do the <laughs> the other thing to try to clean up. I mean, some of my look, side take of the your street time. a little bit. <laughs> I'm a, look, I mean, just, uh, you know, all, all transparency and I appreciate your vulnerability a lot. Um, I love conversations like this. Yeah, so I'm, I'm an Al Anon kid now. And for those that don't want Al Anon, is basically when the dudes that created mm -hmm. Alcoholics Anonymous. We're getting sober. The wives were hanging out and realizing that they were just as crazy as the guys because they were killing themselves literally trying to keep their their men sober and and kind of and sort of uh, support them and fix their mistakes and all the things. So I'm a codependency addict, and so that's mm -hmm. I would consider my central addiction at this point in my life is other people and trying to fix them. Um, but I the idea of sobriety is to me much bigger than substances or not. It's about mm -hmm living in a clear-headed way and dealing with one's emotions. So I just want to applaud you for doing that. Take your time that. with what your version of sobriety is. Um, again, I took 20 years off from every goddamn Yeah, substance. that's crazy. And congratulations um, on all that. I mean. No, totally. And, and it was a very slow, just gentle, like, because if, if I had had trouble with substances when I kind of came back to them, I would have ditched them again. Like I realized that I could do life without them. It's fine. And, but could I have fun? Could it be interesting? Could it be a thing that was additive to my life instead of subtractive? Um, mm -hmm. And it's funny, speaking of opiates and pain and stuff, uh, by the way, that surgery stuff sounds horrible. Um, I got you, my sir. foot crushed. Yeah, man. Fuck. Um, I got my foot crushed by a van uh, oh, my in gosh. around 2010. Um, and that was one of the first times um, I really considered marijuana as a, as a kind of a medicine. I'd always mm -hmm. thought that was kind of bullshit made up by stoners, honestly, but, <laughs> <Sure>. um, <laughs> but, but they had prescribed me opiates for this horrifying pain. I had a, what was called a crush injury in the foot. So it was like all my little metatarsals in my left foot were mm -hmm. dust basically. Um, oh my gosh. and they had prescribed opiates. Mm -hmm. Um, and I was very scared of opiates. Uh, and I, you know, I took a couple of them because it hurt like nothing I've ever felt. Right, you have to. But I, I realized once again how how terrible opiates made me feel. Like how dumb, how dull, how how acute and horrible the pain would be when it came back. I mean, mm -hmm. it was really a, a like a little window into how fucked up and and, and I know you know how fucked mm -hmm. up that world is. So my friend gave me some weed tincture, mm -hmm. and I started using weed tincture instead of the I, I was like i can't uh, i'll deal with the pain i can't deal with the opiate. Right. Like, try this and the pain management that was offered to me by this weed tincture i will that saved my life too because uh -huh. it gave me a way to, to to navigate this you know sort of six month healing journey uh without opiates and i just fuck for anyone out there who's struggling give edibles a chance no you i can completely um, agree with you it switched yeah. for me i was gonna say i i'm such a proponent of that as well because that's how i you know after i finally ended up doing the surgeries and stuff and kind of kicked the kicked the the medications uh yeah. that's what i did i lived in california so i was like well yeah. you know the only way i'm gonna be able to do this i'm not doing with opiates i'm gonna try to go to the, the medical route the weed route worked for a long time and then when i yep. moved to tennessee i had to get another surgery they don't yep. have the that luxury here. So it was like, right. you know, it's just kind of back and forth and all that shit. And now it's Ooh. like, Ooh. Uh, it's been a journey, but I appreciate you sharing that with me. I was just curious because you said, yeah, you, yeah, Same. you yeah. were, you know, you that. had that issue. And then to now I have a lot more 
not a lot more questions, but I'm just curious to know when, when we get into the far and then, you know, getting signed to a label and like having those things around you yeah, to think of like what you, you know, bands you played with and tours you guys were on and just having the, the success and then yeah. seeing that, like the fact that you had the willpower to not, and then do you feel like if you were, if you were to slip and then, you know, relapse or whatever, like would the, would the band have carried on the way that it did? Yes, I do think that I, I, I think I'll be it to the fucking devil to say that right mm -hmm. off the bat. Um, they are a really insidious thing. Uh, and weed is a great, like concentrated weed edibles are a great uh, way to, to wean oneself from opiates. I believe this. Mm -hmm. And weed in super high dosages in the way that it's being industrialized now is also no joke. Like just like, I enjoy it and I think it's become a really sweet little part of my life, but I keep it very cordoned off and mm -hmm. very minimally uh, consumed because A, I know myself and I've got my, I've got my like impulsive, like, give me more of that good substance, please. Um, and I've seen a lot of people get really fucking strung out on weed and it's a different kind of thing and no, it's not going to kill you but it will maybe turn, in you, turn you into kind of a paranoid narcissist. So maybe don't do too much of it. So anyway, I, that's my little I, thing. No, yeah, yeah, I can see that for sure. Um, <laughs> okay, so anyway, jump, okay, yeah, yeah, so school yeah. in, uh, school in uh, Claremont, then you moved to yep. Sacramento or do you move mm -hmm. to the Bay Area? No, Sacto. Um, all my friends moved to, into LA or into the Bay Area, North so cooler music scenes. I moved up to Sacramento to join up with these misfits who wanted a weirdo singer and I wanted a weirdo rock band. How did you find and, uh, them real quick? If you, like, how did that? It was, yeah, uh, mutual friends. Um, I was, I had some friends going to Santa Cruz and I would okay. go up and visit them. And Malcolm, the original bassist from FAR, was visiting also friends at Santa Cruz. And so he and I got to talking and he told me about these guys in Sacramento that he was playing with. And I was getting out of college and I just thought, uh, if I'm going to give this music thing a shot, which honestly, I was ready to just be a teacher. Like I wasn't, I loved mm -hmm. music, but it wasn't, I had no desire to be a rock star or whatever. Um, so I thought, if I'm going to give it a go, now's the time. And so I just went to Sacramento and crashed on Malcolm's floor and worked at Tower Records and started a band. It was really just kind of giving it a shot and again all my friends were in much cooler bands and much cooler scenes but for me Sacto was the perfect place there was all different kinds of bands there were some great all ages venues and more important than anything the rent was really low and the pressure to succeed was therefore really low and I really enjoyed that I am so grateful that I got to start my music career, whatever, in such a low stress place with so much support from my peers, whether it's Deftones or Cake or Little Guilt Shine or I mean, just endless bands, I could say. Um, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And, so, and well, look, back to, back to Kevin Seconds in Seven Seconds. I mean, Seven Seconds and Kevin in particular was just a huge guiding light to me, young in my rock life to see someone who already was such a fucking legend being mm -hmm. so cool to other musicians and you know seven seconds took far out on our first real national tour uh oh, i didn't I'll know that get them for that wow. yeah i mean we you know i think most people would pre presume deftones or you know corner incubus or someone and we did do stuff with all those bands early on via immortal and all the things mm -hmm. and deftones were like brothers to us and all you know of course but yeah seven seconds was the first one band that really took us under their wing and I think more importantly also showed me a world different than like white people dreadlocks and Adidas track suits. Um, like that, cause that wasn't what I was feeling. Um, sure. I, I wanted to do something different. I didn't quite know what it was, but uh, mm -hmm. anyway, yeah, that was Sacto for me. It was just like this beautiful mess of, of creativity and possibility. Amazing. Amazing. And then obviously the band, you get signed to a major label at, at one point yep. in like all of yep. that. Uh, was that like for you to, do you remember like your, your feelings when that was all happening? Was it like, Oh my gosh, like this is really working. And yeah. I mean, I'm a person who remembers 
my life in these weird little impressionistic moments. And so I just trust what I remember. And I remember talking with our, our manager at the time. Uh, oh God, I, I hope that guy's okay. He really turned out to be a nutcase. Um, but at the time he was just this kind of sweet kind of Eeyore manager who really, he was kind of rooting for us, but thought we were too weird to do anything. And I remember saying to him in the van once, I was like, man, all these bands are getting signed. Like, why not us? We can, uh -huh. you know, no one knows what's happening right now. Let's, let's just see what we can do. And I remember that feeling. Um, another thing to thank Kevin for is the first time uh, any A&R person saw us. It was Paul Pontius from Immortal because he came up to see Kevin Second's latest badass band. Um, I believe they were going by Drop Acid at the time. And uh, we were on the same bill and Paul got to see us as well. And that turned into us getting signed to Immortal. Wow. And I remember Paul asking me at one time on a conversation, uh, where do you picture yourself in two years? And I just very coolly, uh, it was very sincere. I said, well, I, I picture us on Immortal on tour, working on our second record. Um, I was like, where do you picture us? And he's like, I picture you on the label. I was like, okay, well, that was easy. Um, <laughs> And so it was a very simple thing, very friendly. Uh, and then I think the next thing I really remember is mine was the address that our first advance check came to. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe the whole deal was 150 and we got a $50,000 kind of advance to get shit and stuff. And then a hundred was going towards making the record, I believe. And even though I was, you know, we were splitting the $50,000 check four ways or whatever. Um, so it wasn't a ton of money, but I literally thought I had one publisher's clearinghouse suite. I thought I had the sure. man showed up at my house, like a check for $50,000. Like, even though it wasn't mine, just the feeling, this is for making music. It just, I will never forget that feeling. That's incredible. That's incredible. And yeah. then wh when do you end up starting One Line Drawing? So One Line Drawing God, Kevin's getting mentioned a lot in this. Uh, <laughs> I I put out a little cassette. Far was still together, but we were showing signs of wear and tear. Um, mm -hmm. We had recorded Water and Solutions. Uh, the whole run had been tough. I mean, we made a, you know, tin cans. We were proud of it, but we knew we didn't quite get it right. And no one in the world knew at all what to do with us. I mean, we were on tour. We'd be on tour with Strife and Snapcase one day and, playing a show with fucking Jets to Brazil and Promise Ring the next day and then Monster Magnet and then Corn and then Sepultura and then Seven Seconds and then uh, just just Sense Field. I mean, we would just play with so many different types of bands and we'd either be the band on the bill that was way too loud or way too sensitive. It was never <laughs> it was never quite right. Right at the middle. <laughs> and, and you know We were perfectly happy in doing our thing, but it didn't make sense. And we were sort of coming apart at the seams. I mm -hmm. was really more and more interested in, we need some choruses here. Mm -hmm. We need some melodies. Sean was super into riffs. And obviously riffs were making big money at that time. Um, I was, uh, yeah, I was just not the same I could have presented myself as a front man that was way more aggressive and bro -y, and it just wasn't who I was. Mm -hmm. And it, it was not good for us, commercially speaking, frankly. It just wasn't. Um, I, it, we no one knew what to do with us. Um, mm -hmm. And we made, we're, we were very proud of Water and Solutions when we made it. But no one really knew what to do with that one either. Um, remember, this is 98 when that record came out. Right, uh, just so before it's time. And it really, like, way before it's time. Um, and by the way, speaking of sobriety, one of my, what became a really odd straight edge anthem at the time was a song called Really Here because of the line, uh, and I will always wonder why I am all, always sober and everyone is loaded and it gets old. Mm -hmm. um, and so to your point, if I had fallen off the wagon then, it would have been weird, I suppose, because at that time, I don't think anyone in FAR was doing any substances, and we were vaguely a 
aligned with the straight edge scene, although I made it a real point to not be aligned with the more violent parts of the straight edge scene. Uh-huh. Never been a fan of dogma, especially when it leads to violence. Um, but it would have been weird for sure if I had started getting wasted then. Um, I, More importantly than what would have happened to me in FAR, I truly think that at that time in my life, I mean, I had a little daughter, a band that was on the rocks that was my only source of income, a marriage that was falling apart. Um, if I had, man, if I had slipped at that time in my life, I think it would have been a quick and long descent for me i i I can't say what would have happened sure but i think i was white knuckling it through my life already um just getting by on sheer will and angst and man if i had fucking slipped and done drugs i just don't even know but it would not have been good so yeah i'm glad you didn't wow that's a wow okay i'm real glad i didn't too i'm real glad i didn't do and so then yeah you start one line drawing off the basis of kind of what was happening there with the band and yeah. Um. You put some records out just to kind of jump oh, wait, so ahead. Wait, 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 wait. Yo, wait. So one line. Yeah. Wait. You. I see. I distract myself. Oh my god. No. One line was, I think, me trying to process both the end of my marriage and the end of Far because I was writing songs that that Far didn't like. Um, fourteen to forty one. I wrote when I was in Far. Better oh, wow. than this. I wrote when I was in Far. Hostage. I wrote when I was in Far letter I wrote when I was in FAR I tried to sell all of those songs to the band and they didn't bite and after you know one more incredibly frustrating tour on Water and Solutions I said I I really if you guys don't want to make these songs just give me a second to go make these songs because I love this band but I want these songs to have a a life Mm -hmm. so I made a little cassette uh, called Jonah's One Line Drawing that was uh and released it on Kevin's label, Pop Rocket. Um, Mm -hmm. And we released it literally in a little plastic bag with a little Xerox, you know, piece of paper wrapped around the tape. And and it was just a cool little, yeah, it was just the hissiest little crazy ass cassette thing. But at the time it was such a relief for me because I'd been doing this really heavy, loud music. And there was something just about getting back to, again, as we've talked about me and a guitar, what can I do? just with this no Mm -hmm. expensive gear no recording studios no bands no producers no labels no managers just me and the songs and so that's what one line drawing started out as was just a real adventure in that and i would say the first break came for that well i mean first of all far broke up and i didn't know what Mm -hmm. the fuck i was going to do so in some ways one line drawing was a real little labor of love that was then forced into like oh, now I'm going to need to generate income doing this weird little shit? Okay, let's see what happens now. And the first one-line drawing, the first things I released were home recordings made in Sacramento and in Oakland when I moved to there. Um, The first thing I did was called Pollyanna. It -hmm. came out out on a comp called Songs for the Brokenhearted um, that Jimmy Earl was was also on, actually. I think think mine was the first track on it and i think jimmy's closed that comp um and so that was a cool little adventure and then the sketchy eps were just me literally releasing my demos because it was time to go play shows and i didn't know what else to do and luckily people dug it so it Mm -hmm. was really this ass backwards thing um yeah anyway so that's what happened and that led to one line drawing and then one line drawing kind of blew up in Mm -hmm. you know in this very miniature way but then i would start that's when this weird thing happened where i would start playing with bands who far had influenced but i would be the weird solo acoustic guy opening for thursday i saw you open a handful that's how i got to know you actually i I knew far i knew far but i didn't put it all together because this is like in the day and age of really not uh, yeah you know wikipedia wasn't around quite yet so like <laughs> yeah, totally. i finally figured i was like oh wait no wait hold and i started putting it all together i'm like but this doesn't sound anything like far like what are you talking about my my, right. my buddy was like early adapt uh, like early adopter to like finding stuff online and like file sharing online so he's the one that actually told us about it i we went and saw you i think it was at like the epicenter in mira mason san diego and you're opening up nice. for somebody i can't yeah. remember who it was yes. But that's kind of where I started getting hip to what you were doing with one line drawing. 
Um, but yeah, it's I, you were opening up for somebody. That's crazy to think of how that all kind of. I wish I could, I'm sure yeah, I could so, look it up and figure it out. But anyway, uh, two fun, two funny things that come to mind about that. One, the Epicenter show. I kind of remember that show actually. Um, that that's crazy. You brought that name up. But uh, two two main things. One. New End Original was opening for Jets to Brazil at the Ventura Theater. And a kid came up to me after we had played and I was at the merch table. And he said, I got I owe you an apology. And I was like, oh, what, what's up, man? He said, for the first half of your set, I was so mad at you because I was like, who is this motherfucker ripping off Jonah from One Line Drawing? Uh, <laughs> and I was like, and I was like, oh, my God. And so it was just or no, Jonah from far, he would have said because One Line yeah. and New End were both coming out. Um, uh -huh. But so New End was the first thing to really hit, though, because Thriller was released before Visitor, actually, as just as the odd way that played out. And, and New End was so kind of big in that scene so fast. Um, so anyway, so the point was, like, no one could tell, the, like, knew who I was because I was just this guy <laughs> that was, like, in, like, three bands at once or something. Sure. Um, and, uh, and that was even back then before all the other bands. But yeah, so um, that, was a, that was a trippy thing. And um, yeah, anyway, yeah. Okay, well, I'm curious. So... But then you kind of dissolved the project, what, like in about 18 years ago, 20 yeah, years I, ago, I mean? Yeah, I think I'm kind of allergic to expectations, I suppose. Okay. Um, and when I started One Line Drawing, again, is 98. So this is when all the bands are going on. But, and I put up the first you know, One Line Drawing stuff in 99. By the time 2001 or two or three rolls around, literally like everyone's quit the rock band and has started a, like a pseudo, uh, a pseudonym side project, you know? <laughs> right, like, right, right, right. Like, so, so now everyone's doing that. And now the emo scene is kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. um, and everyone's kind of expecting me to be kind of angsty and mopey all the time. And I can definitely do some angst and mope and I adore it very much. And I love silly shit too. I love heavy shit too. I love hyper melodic, big chorusy stuff too. So when I started to feel kind of the walls closing in on me in terms of people expecting me to be a certain thing, like the very reason I started one line drawing, like it's literally about the idea of, you pick up a pencil and you start drawing until it's done. Like it, it just, you don't stop, you keep going. And I think I was really wary of being pigeonholed. And I kind of saw other people, not to say copying me per se, I'm not going to be all like that about it, but, but getting into this similar zone that I was already living in. Mm -hmm. And I just didn't, I didn't, I just didn't like it. It just felt crowded and it felt full of expectations. The crowds were getting to be a little sceney for me. And by that, I mean, they were there, I think more to hang out than to actually dig the music. Mm -hmm. um, and again, I'm just, I'm kind of just a little loner who really, really, really is a believer in music. And there's some of us around, I guess I'm just going to go ahead and call you one because of the way you're so nerdy and wonderful about it. <laughs> but a lot of a lot of people that are around music are around it because we've we've somehow in our culture got this thing called being a rock star and at this point it doesn't have anything to do with being a, mu a musician you know like you're a rock star you know it's just <laughs> sure. so it, it's a strange world we're in but i i really couldn't give a shit about that i just i'm grateful that i've sustained my life doing this i love this life but i bailed on one line drawing because I didn't want to ruin what I thought was kind of an interesting little situation that I had. And, um, and then of course, as you're probably about to say, I stumble into the major labels again mm -hmm. with gratitude mm -hmm. um, and I'm back in this big studio world. So I've ditched my, you know, my relatively successful indie pseudonym project. I'm in this like major label band, but then of course that, you know, totally failed. Um, and I go back to just, then I was just playing under my own name for a while, which then felt wonderful for a while. Um, and it was fun to do. But for some reason, this record, even this record was going to be a Jonah Matranga record. Um, and then something about, 
I went through a lot over COVID that I think happened for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And what I came out of it with was that, so I'm me Mm -hmm. and I like being me unattached to anything involving being a human being, uh, much less uh, a commodity. Those, those, those two things don't interest me very much. I'm curious about being alive. I'm mm-hmm. curious about being a creature. Um, but any uh, specificity beyond that, I don't really like. And so what I discovered was that one line drawing for me, that's my outward facing avatar to the world. Like this is my creative thing. This is what mm-hmm. I do. I'm creating this stuff. That's one line drawing. And from now on, you know, we'll see, I'll probably break my word like two seconds after this interview. Um, but, but from now on, whether it's the heaviest shit you're ever going to hear in your life or the silliest shit or the sweetest shit or the saddest shit, it's going to be one line drawing because it's really all it ever was. So looking back mm-hmm. on it, I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and say that I'm a little annoyed with myself. I'm grateful for New End Original. I think we made a great record. I'm grateful for Gratitude. I'm grateful for Far coming back. I'm mm-hmm. grateful for all the solo records. And I really think all of that could have been under one line drawing and I probably would have been better off for it, but I got a little scared because it was getting a little too sceney for me. And I think I like to shoot myself in the foot once in a while so I can kind of reset. Um, so I think that's what happened. But all I can say is that when I realized, oh my God, this is one line drawing, everything about the new record finally made sense and everything about kind of who I am as an artist made sense again. So it was a weird, uh, time away but all i can say is that it feels so right to be back <laughs> i love that i love that and did this record i know you i know you've got a, another one after this but i'm just curious like was this a record you've been writing for a while or did these songs kind of come pretty quickly or and at what point did you kind of know you're going to do or was there a point that you knew you wanted to do a record yeah some yeah some combo um <clears throat> of the two here wait give me one more second i'm gonna get a little cough drop because i feel myself getting hoarse and i want to do this before we have to go All right. Um, so, I myself am just getting over COVID, actually. Too. Oh my gosh! Um, I hope you're alright. Yeah, I, I, I talked I, to somebody I, earlier this this afternoon, or yeah, earlier this morning that had it also. That we're we're just yep, getting a, got, you know better from it. Yep. After four jabs and thirty odd months into this crazy ass thing, I finally get this stupid thing. Um, luckily, I mean, knock on wood, I feel like I'm through the worst of it, and life is good but still a little bit weird. Anyway, um, yeah, this record, a long time ago, I just focused on creating songs. And when they found their way onto a record or even being finished at all, that'd be fine. So sounds odd to say, but I would say the roots of this record, the last solo record I did before this, <clears throat> um, was called Me and You Are Two. And as part of the Kickstarter for that record, I got into a weird thing where I told everyone, I promised everyone that I was going to record and like to write, I was gonna write, record and release um, one, if not a full song, but like at least a verse and a chorus or something every day uh for a year and but i wouldn't release it publicly i would send the idea for that one day i think i said it, yeah if we can get 365 people on this kickstarter then i will one person in the world will receive an idea every day this year that's awesome so only so only one person besides me heard all of these ideas and then when i got to the end of the year yeah, it was such a fun experiment. I loved it. That's so um, cool. I realized that, you know, there's a lot, there were these, these kind of like fun little throwaway weirdo ideas, but there's a, there's some like some little buddies in there, some like hooks. And I thought, wow. So now if I took my favorite of these, um, which were, were kind of a bunch, I think I came up with, 
you know, it's probably a, probably like a, a hundred out of the bunch or something like that, um, that I thought really had some legs, um, that could be built out and I realized, wow, cool. So now I could, um, well, you know, I could release, you know, one of these a month and it would go on for years and years and years. Um, so it was a real fun, fertile time. So I would say this record in a lot of ways started then. There are at least a few songs on the record that started in 2014, literally conceived of and recorded that day that then I went back to and kind of teased out. Um, mm -hmm. I think Serious Question is one of those. I believe This Is Water is one of those. I believe Don't Give Up is one of those. Um, I believe Get a Dog is one of those. There might be a couple others. Oh, yeah, yeah. Hello From Here is one of those. Um, those all started in this storm of ideas over a year. And then they just kind of hung around for several years because I, I really just, I make it a point to not rush ideas. Mm -hmm. I, I, I leave them. And if they're calling to me, then I'll kind of go back to them. But what's even more fun is that when one idea I write, I'll go, oh shit, that idea that I came up with like eight years ago, it finally has a chorus. Yes. And I stick them together oh. and then I've got a song. Um, so I consider the way I write kind of more modular than anything else. I'm just okay. looking for the moment. And mm -hmm. then when they can kind of get cobbled together into a tune, they become that. So I think this record did start a long time ago, but it's funny because a lot of it was written rather quickly, but it was written rather quickly at very different times. Mm -hmm. And then none of it was written quickly in the sense that I then took a lot of time with all of these songs to kind of just, yeah, just to kind of fit them together and make sure I was saying exactly what I wanted to say. So it was a really beautiful process. And then the recording of it was another incredibly beautiful collaborative process with my friends, Jeremy and Norman and a bunch of other people that made the record with me. Um, and that was more of a product of COVID and, uh, everyone being fucking sitting at home with having nothing to do. So we got to yeah. do some really fun stuff together. But yeah, That's the cool. songs, the songs arrived quickly and yet took a long time, which says That's a lot amazing. about me. Yeah, because you look yeah. at the the credits in the record, I mean, you have a lot of big big names or big band people, you know, Texas The Reason, yeah. you know, Chris, Chris from Dashboard and like mm -hmm. just so, such a cool- Zach from Jimmy Eat World plays, yeah, Zach, uh, plays yeah. on your home. Okay. Yep. Um, and Jake then, from and I also, Bear, yeah, oh, yeah, plays on Departure, oh. yeah. Yeah. Okay. So much. And so much great stuff. That's so awesome. And then I was just to comment on one of the songs with "This Is Water." You said that that was one of the old ones, but I'm like, like lyrically, I thought I was like, well, this is so like relevant to now. But but then it made sense where you're talking about maybe mashing some chorus up or blah 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 from from back in the day, and maybe that had that same uh, yeah approach. Yeah, I, I'm I'm pretty sure it did. And at the same time, what I, a thing I've learned about songs over the years is that. There are, I mean, there's a bunch of songs. You know, we talked about communication that, you know, 15, when I was 15 years old, but there's a lot of songs, like Water and Solutions, actually, I, those songs still lyrically still speak. <laughs> yeah. yeah, like they, they, they feel real solid and, and like kind of feel real prophetic in a lot of ways. Like they really talk right. about a lot of shit that ended up happening in a lot. I mean, it's, the, the lyrics can be pretty obtuse, but for me at least sure they're very uh very compelling songs to listen back to and i certainly wasn't thinking of what i'm thinking about now but i guess i was and it all goes back to that little communication song because i think all i've ever been trying to do with this is water for instance you know the lyric so what are you going to bring what are you going to do um it it just I think my songs are a little invitation to myself and they're a little challenge to myself. And I think they're an invitation to the world mm -hmm. and they're a challenge to the world. And, and it's, it's more than, it's just they're the way I, the, that I navigate it. So I would like to think, and you might be right that I refined this as water, but I would not be surprised if the lyrics came out and then they found out what they were about. Um, Interesting. And I'm not a particularly... I'm not a real like real like, real, like woo woo new agey guy, but there's a song called Nestle off of Water and Solutions, a far song that for hip hop enthusiasts, uh, the hook ended up on a Lupe Fiasco track called The Instrumental. 
Thank you, Mike Shinoda, for that uh, session. Um, but Nestle was a song that I wrote that I thought I was writing about my father. And then I found out I was going to be a father. And I realized that before I even knew I was, I had been writing about those fears. And I'm not trying to be psychic hotline here, but I just know that's true. Like uh -huh. I thought I was writing about my dad and then I was writing about myself. And um, it's a very strange feeling, but I, I truly believe that the songs are smarter than I am and that I'm only now figuring out what they're about. Um, and I, that will continue. Like yeah. a song that means one thing to me now in 10 years, I'm pretty sure it will mean something else. And <laughs> sure. I don't really understand. I don't understand, but I'm here for it. <laughs> yeah, I love it. Well, John, thank you so much do oh for God. doing this. I really appreciate it. This has been uh, so much fun. I know you have another interview to get to. Um, I, have I don't want to more... go. I don't want to go. Okay, <laughs> give me my, one that's more. That's the give best one more. thing give I've more. ever heard. Give me one more. Uh, I just want, it's <clears throat> my, my generic one is just if you have any advice for aspiring artists. Yes, I have a really, a really, a really easy one that might not be what people want to hear. Um, if you're talking about making shit, and being to your thing about self-consciousness and stuff, whether it's stage fright or being scared to show someone your, your drawing, mm -hmm. um, as it were, try to remember that no one else gives a shit, really. They care about you. They love you. They might even love music. They might be curious about what you're doing. It might even mean a lot to them. But they actually don't give a shit because they've got their own life to give a shit about. They've got their own fears and struggles. So all you really need to worry about if you're an aspiring artist is if you give a shit. So if you give a shit, good. Have it come from that place. Don't worry about anyone else caring because they don't because they can't. It's impossible. No one will ever care about your shit as much as you do. So you be the one. And then if you have financial aspirations, <laughs> if you have career aspirations, here's the easy one. Two easy things. Drive from let's say San Diego to Dallas, Texas. And if you've made it through that drive alive, um, then you might be cut out for touring. Um, and then figure out how much you need to live for a year. Uh, you know, how much you need to pay your rent for a year. Do the equations. And then figure out how many shows you'd need to play at how much of a profit and how much gas would cost and how much the t-shirts would cost and how much the profit margin is. And if at any point during all of those figuring outs about how, how you would need to live for a year by making music, if you get bored or frustrated or anything like that, definitely don't go into being an artist because it's a fucking grind. And if you don't love it so much, it will eat you alive. And or you'll become, if you're lucky enough to have someone support you and you're super talented, but you're still not exactly sure what you're doing there, you'll become like so many wonderful artists I know where they're kind of run by their managers and run by their labels. And they're literally at the, at the height of success and fame, but they're like, you know, medicated and suicidal and self-harming and addicted to this and addicted to that and like totally fucked up. And there's a reason that happens. And I think it's really sensitive people doing things that maybe they never really wanted to do. And maybe what you always wanted to do is just make some songs and help yourself feel a little bit better about the weirdness of the world and your life. And so that's the advice that I would offer to anyone bothering to care about this um, is just make sure you give a shit and make sure you give a shit enough to go through the dull stuff because the minute you lose ownership of it or lose direction, things can get pretty crazy pretty quick. And I wouldn't wish it upon anyone, but I do wish you all of the songs in the world. I really, I really do. Bring it back,